Hello, everyone. If everyone's coming into the room, welcome to Best Practices for Situating Oneself as a Podcaster in Academia. Um, there's just two more people looking to join from the waiting room, and then I will get us actually started here. In the meantime, my name is Stacey Copeland. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands in Media and Journalism Studies. Um, but from my accent, you can probably tell that is not where I'm from. I'm originally Canadian and uh, also co-direct Amplify Podcast Network, which is a scholarly podcasting network and community based out of Canada with uh, Dr. Hannah McGregor. So today I'm going to be chairing our panel um, with four wonderful presentations from five wonderful researchers and podcasters. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for each presentation and then a short amount of time, about 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end. So uh, to start us off on our panel on best practices for situating oneself as a podcaster in academia, I'm gonna hand things over to Daniel Story. Daniel is a digital scholarship librarian at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he supports students and faculty engaging uh, with things like GIS, podcasting and digital storytelling. He is a consulting editor for the American Historical Review and is host and producer of the journal's podcast, History in Focus. He was the lead producer of the 2020 documentary podcast series, Stories from the Epicenter, which explores the history and memory of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in Santa Cruz County, California. And uh, in progress is a field recording project called Santa Cruz County Sounds Like, and an audio doc series examining the US housing crisis through the lens of Santa Cruz, California, the most expensive real, uh, rental market in the country now two years running. Daniel holds a PhD in history from Indiana University and sounds like he keeps very busy podcasting. So I look forward to your presentation, Daniel. Uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, I'm going to uh, share my slides here, if I can make that happen. And then hopefully you can see that. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, I appreciate the introduction and excited to talk to you all here today. Um, I have a, a talk that has a perhaps slightly provocative title. Um, for all the podcasting I do, um, sometimes I get a little bit restless with calling myself a podcaster. And um, so so I'm going to take you down what might be a slightly meandery kind of um, thought thought experiment or, or rather maybe a tour through my thinking on on this um, this uh, topic of kind of how we talk about the work that we do and how we frame it. In fact, how we label it. So I am poking at what one might think of as the most ubiquitous of best practices, calling our work podcasting. Um, so it is ostensibly about labels and descriptors, but really um, what I am interested in here is what's exciting, full, exciting and meaningful about our work and how we frame it, frame that work so that it's legible to um, the, our colleagues, the various contexts that we work in, um, and and um, so that's kind of what I want to dig into here for a few minutes. And um, I will say right now that I'm not, in fact, actually interested in rejecting the term podcast or podcasting altogether, nor am I ambitiously trying to coin a new term in 15 minutes uh, that we might all adopt. That is not what I'm after here, uh, but I am um, interested in reflecting a little bit on what seems to me is some of the the baggage around the term podcast or the, the the image of a podcaster in our culture and I will just you know say that I, I'm in a, the a US context so so the lens through which I see these things is is through American academia um, uh, so that may not directly um, translate to other places but hopefully this will at least resonate to some degree. But as I look out into the wider culture, um, the the image of a podcaster um, isn't always the most flattering. Um, you know, there's the everyone has a podcast now kind of trope <laughs> that you can see um, per, talked about or portrayed in various places. 
Um, I think about the show Only Murders in the Building, which is all kind of satirically poking fun at this idea of everyone uh, has a podcast now, or you look out and see, um, you know, Joe Rogan type podcasting or the latest celebrity podcaster, you can take your pick. And when I think about those things, I don't especially love the idea that my own work might be construed um, as as being a little bit unserious or me chasing a fad or, or any of us uh, here chasing a fad. And then when we think about the world of academia, podcasting has been around for a while. So um, there are, I think, a lot of people who, who are um, a lot more tuned into what this work is and why it's um, exciting and meaningful. Um, but there are definitely, at least in my experience, still some corners of the world of um, humanities, academia that might find podcasting a little suspect or perhaps just not um, so well understood as to its value for research, teaching, um, the various missions of our departments and institutions. Um, and um, I do think those kinds of misunderstandings are on the decline, and I'm thankful for that for sure. But I think those kinds of dynamics do still exist. So as I think about this kind of potential baggage or misunderstanding around what it means to be a podcaster or be a academic podcaster um, and, you know, encapsulated to some degree in my unease with the very term podcast, um, that has kind of sent me down this road of, of exploration that has actually been pretty um, surprisingly positive um, and generative for me in thinking about how we might describe our work and position ourselves um, in, in this world of academic podcasting. So um, what is it that um, got me started down this particular road of, of thinking about the term podcast? Well, for me anyway, and I'm, you know, a sort of a side note on this entire presentation, I'd love to hear uh, from folks as to if this resonates with any of your experience, um, or it, perhaps I'm the only one here. But um, I found, uh, kind of to my surprise a little bit over the last couple of years, as podcasting has become more and more a part of my work um, as an academic, that I have tended to not want to lead with the term podcaster or describing my work as podcasting, be that in kind of um, passing interactions with people or in the way that I write up um, and frame my work um, in, in other kinds of academic venues. Um, I just, you know, almost instinctively found myself a little uneasy with it. And instead I found um, kind of tumbling out of my mouth uh, <laughs> uh, things like digital storyteller or public humanist or public historian, oral historian, uh, sometimes I describe myself as an audio producer um, or an audio storyteller. Um, sometimes I describe myself as an audio creator or a podcast editor. Occasionally, I'm a documentarian or maybe a narrative podcaster. And I'm quite certain that this is not an exhaustive list. I, um, you know, kind of find myself instinctively reaching for a number of different descriptors for how I um, work or what my work is as a as an academic podcaster. Um, and when I look around at some other colleagues in the field, um, dig around on their websites, um, I actually find a pretty similar wide variety of of terminology and things that people use to describe and describe themselves. Um, one um, historian podcaster, uh, Natalie uh, Pertzella, that I um, I uh, know to some degree and really respect her work as a podcaster. Um, her website literally has a scrolling list of descriptors um, that that describes who she is as an academic. Podcaster is actually in that list, um, but it's alongside a number of other things like scholar, teacher, writer, consultant. Um, and uh, another person that I, I think does terrific work and, and really pioneering work in the realm of academic podcasting is Liz Covart of the podcast Benjamin, um, um, Benjamin Franklin's World. Um, ben Franklin's World, yes. Um, and she on her website describes herself as someone who, quote, practices scholarly history, public history, and digital humanities. And the term podcast doesn't actually appear in that list at all. Um, 
And uh, looking a little more widely, maybe outside of the, the world of academia, but something that's certainly in my mind adjacent to, to humanities uh, podcasting um, is somebody like Erica Heilman of the, you know, really um, terrific podcast Rumble Strip. And on her website, she describes herself as creating not podcast episodes, but quote, messy, obsessively crafted stories of the everyday. So as I see all this variety and creativity in describing the work that we do, and in fact, who we are as, as um, academics who work in podcasting and in other things, um, I actually am really inspired by this. I can't help but think that it's not so much um, a rejection of the term podcast as it is us collectively and individually trying to unearth what it is that's vital about the work that we do, what's exciting, what's meaningful about it. And, you know, maybe we are casting around a little bit for how to describe that and how to label it. And that's okay. Um, it's, it's pretty um, exciting in a way, as I kind of went down this road of, you know, exploring, if you will, my unease with the term podcast or podcaster. Um, and certainly one of the things that um, this leads me to think more about, and I think lots of people are doing this, is thinking about what's meaningful, what the kind of why questions of, of why we do this kind of work. And this is one, if you will, um, uh, direction that this kind of restlessness in my own head has led me to think more about kind of in a granular way. And certainly one of the biggest, uh, most common answers that we find out there um, for why us humanities academic podcasters engage in this kind of work is the ability to reach different and diverse audiences. And, you know, this is such a common um, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not justification exactly, but th this is this is a common understanding of why podcasting is valuable to the kind of work that we do. Um, but I wanted to put it in here, any it, um, even though it's, it is so common that um, I think in the moment that we're in right now, this is such an important, um, such an important quality that that podcasting unlocks for those of us who work in the realm of academia to be able to um, communicate the work that that is so vital to uh, broader broader audiences and and um, make it um, accessible and useful to to the broader public, particularly in in this. Um, kind of fraught uh, moment that that we're all living through right now. Um, and very much connected to that is the idea that uh, that working in podcasting as an academic can make us better writers, better communicators of our scholarship in other venues and in other ways. Um, I have been um, really like uh, going uh, into um, the work of the late anthropologist David Graeber over the last couple of weeks, in particular uh, since the recent U.S. election, uh, finding a little bit of solace in in his brilliant mind. And one of the things that um, I came across was um, him talking about, uh, a, a, rather a colleague um, reached out to him, actually not long before he passed away in 2020, to compliment how accessible his writing was. And his response was, I call it being nice to the reader, which is kind of an extension of the politics in a sense. And so I think that in this moment that we live in, writing well invites engagement and curiosity, and it can in fact be a radical act. And if all that podcasting ever did for us was to make us better communicators in other venues, that alone, I think, would be worth it. But of course, there's much more than that. And certainly, as humanists, we can think about lots of ways that podcasting brings out distinctly humanist qualities, such as emotion, affect, and everything that goes with the power of the human voice. Um, I think these are all things that we can get behind when we, we, we think about that why question of what makes this work so meaningful. And then, of course, we can also think in more granular ways about how um, podcasting speaks to the particulars of our um, distinct disciplines. Um, and I, I know many of us work in, in venues where we're doing a lot of interdisciplinary work, um, but there's still, I think, value to thinking about um, how 
For instance, um, I work with a lot of folks here at UC Santa Cruz who are in the either the lit program or the writing program um, who use podcasting a lot. And we talk a lot about um, how podcasting helps um, students think about um, writing voice and how to move between different genres of writing. Um, as a historian, that's my background, my training. Um, there's a lot of interesting overlap with the field of oral history, some tension as well, but some interesting overlap. Public history, thinking about um, ways of bringing in primary sources and engaging different types of primary sources um, when we tell history or exp when we um, narrate history through the lens of, of audio. And um, you know, there are other um, affordances that audio and podcasting allows for um, in other disciplines as well. Um, and and I would love to, to hear how other folks who are in this uh, session who might be positioned in some of those other disciplines talk about and frame their work in those ways. But I think uh, for me, the bigger picture is um, as we think about these things together, um, we, or rather we have often, I think, framed our work in different contexts and in different ways, but I at least have not experienced podcasters, uh, academic podcasters talking a lot and sharing notes with each other. And if anything you take away from um, my, my little meandering um, presentation here is that I would love for us to be talking about this with each other more. The last little um, thing that going down this uh, sort of mental exercise has done for me is to really, in a way, spark my curiosity in the ways that um, audio, the medium of audio can be pushed in um, and moved in, in different directions. It's kind of um, taken me um, down the road of exploring other forms of audio work. Um, and for me, that's been looking at field recording. It's been delving into experimental audio projects the work of folks who would describe themselves as sound artists. Um, I find a lot of inspiration in, in these kinds of things. And if nothing else, um, maybe the takeaway here is if you feel a little restless with uh, what might be a constricting um, image of what a podcaster is in our culture, um, uh, push on that uh, by following your curiosity to push the boundaries of the medium. That's kind of what it has sparked in me. So um, as I said, I hope that um, if anything, that this uh, unease with the term podcaster or podcasting um, does is actually break open um, some of these deeper questions of what is in fact um, meaningful and compelling and exciting about the work that we do. Because I think we're, that we're doing a lot of really um, innovative, interesting exciting work um and you know the sessions that i've been in um for, for this symposium have, have certainly been a testament to that um i'd love for us to um use some of these things to uh break open the conversation Daniel, if, you, yeah. if you could wrap up as well thanks wrapping up now yeah how do you describe your work does anyone else feel this sort of unease or or restlessness and um is this a conversation worth having? I would love to hear your thoughts and I'm wrapping up. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, being our first speaker. Next up, we have uh, Shiva Manali, who is an assistant professor of technical and professional communication at the University of Memphis. Uh, a scholar in rhetoric and composition, he holds a PhD from the University of Louisville. And he had some formative experience working as a postdoctoral research fellow at North Dakota in 2023. He delves into the intersection of AI and pedagogy, exploring pervasive or persuasive technologies, alpha persuasion, ambient rhetoric, and digital rhetoric. So I will hand things over to Shiva. Please take the floor. Thank you, Professor Stacy. So are you hearing me loud and clear, guys? Okay, <laughs> so I would like to keep my presentation brief. I don't want to take more time. I would like to set aside uh, uh, more chunks of time for Q and A. So, so let me start in this way. 
So guys, we have been hearing numerous narratives uh, about artificial intelligence affordances ever since chat GPT was launched by OpenAI people started uh, talking about uh, various potential ways in which uh, AI affordances can be harnessed. And uh, students, learners, instructors, critics, code writers, engineers, and composers explored uh, a wide variety of ways to tap into uh, every form of digital affordances yielded by artificial intelligence. Actually, so many people subscribe to ChatGPT within a short span of time that uh, people started arguing that we are in the age of AI revolution. And uh, we were totally dazzled by so many affordances yielded by artificial intelligence. People started using AI to edit their writing. They use AI to generate content. They use AI to engineer images. They use AI to rewrite their writing. They use AI to write code. They use AI in every way possible. And uh, in the writing and rhetorical classes, instructor started uh, talking about AI literacy, AI pedagogy, AI affordances, persuasive technology, alpha persuasion, classroom was abuzz with numerous uh, jargons and parlance related to artificial intelligence. How to leverage AI affordances became the overriding questions. And uh, as people started using AI, soon they developed a painful awareness that uh, in AI content, uh, uh, there was bound to be numerous traces of misinformation, disinformation, grammatical slippage, misstates, punctuation error, not only this. In some AI contents, the people found uh, some elements of racist slides and slurs. The problem got uh, more severe when Google rebranded its uh, uh, immature uh, uh, Gen AI bar and relaunch it as Gemini. Within a couple of uh, days after Google relaunched uh, its uh, much bounded Gen AI chatbot Gemini, people started using Gemini to create images uh, which were racially shocking. Someone used uh, Gemini to create uh, images of Nazi soldiers and Google's much bounded Gen AI, Gemini created images of Nazi soldiers uh, who were all uh, African-American soldiers. In history, we didn't have any, any African-American Nazi soldier. Someone used Gemini to create an image of our founding father, George Washington, and uh, Gemini created an image of uh, George Washington uh, that uh, resembled uh, the face and body of an African-American soldier. Google had to suffer from a huge backlash uh, heightened by its uh, crashing uh, stock uh, price. Google paused its uh, image engineering feature embedded in the Gemini chatbot. And questions arose about uh, uh, the justice-oriented uh, AI pedagogy, how to use AI in a responsible way, how to tap into AI affordances in such, an, in such a way that it uh, aligns with the uh, human values. <clears throat> and people started hearing some catchphrases such as constitutional AI, practice constitutional AI, uh, use AI in such a way that it want uh, interfere with our cherished values and academic norms. And this is a question of justice, ethics, arose, you know. So at that time, many users of artificial intelligence thought that uh, uh, the only problem with uh, AI is that in its content, uh, uh, we can notice 
some elements uh, and evidence of uh, racism, biases, prejudices, uh, some traces of junk science, cross-pollinating conspiracy theories and defects, you know, then people paid attention to only this aspect of the darker consequentiality of depending upon artificial intelligence in the uh, direction toward augmenting our intelligence. See, we need to go beyond this. That is my point. We all are scared by looming threat of a anthropocentrism. We are uh, a direct witness to numerous disasters uh, that have been happening because of climate change and environmental degradation. In this scenario, it makes sense to talk about uh, environmental justice, ecological justice. It is reasonable to ignite uh, some rounds of conversation about, uh, eco how about addressing eco-anxiety, about uh, promoting environmental justice, about uh, aligning AI affordances uh, with our uh, pressing and burgeoning demand for environmental justice. But a vast majority of people are simply ignorant about uh, so much environmental uh, damage contributed by artificial intelligence users. That is my point. I'm uh, reminded of uh, a sentence uttered by the protagonist in the movie, The Wizard of Oz. Don't pay attention to the, uh, don't pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. This statement is very popular. The wizard says at a climactic moment in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Let me take this line and say, I don't, use the word don't pay attention to or pay no attention to, I say, pay attention to the dark reality lurking behind the curtain of AI affordances, behind the curtain of our fascination with AI affordances, there is a darker reality. That is, each time we use artificial intelligence, either to generate a content or engineer some sets of images, we are a culprit in the release of greenhouse gases. I like to read. I don't want to take uh, many time, more time. Just I like to take. Uh, oh, I like to mention some data. See what is the recent studies have shown that training a single large language model can emit as much as uh, six hundred twenty-six thousand one hundred fifty-five pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent equal to the lifetime emissions of hype cars. As AI models grow more complex, their environmental impact intensifies. For example, GPT-3 with its 175 billion parameters is estimated to have consumed 100, uh, 1,287 megawatts of electricity during training, resulting in 552 tons of CO2 emission, Patterson, I quoted this author. The problem extends beyond training. Daily usage of AI chatbots for image engineering and content generation contributes significantly to ongoing emission. A study by the University of Massachusetts Amherst found that running deep learning models, means large language model, for natural language processing tasks can produce nearly 30 pounds of CO2 emission equivalent to charging 30, 13,000 smartphones. Each time we use artificial intelligence to get something done, we are culpable for contributing to the emission of greenhouse gas. So we are not aware of this. No. Millions of people are using artificial intelligence almost on a daily basis. See, even if each individual's contribution to the emission of CO2 is infinitesimal, but collectively, if we count uh, count uh, all the users of artificial intelligence chatbot in a day, imagine what will be the volume of CO2 emissions. We have been making so much investment in uh, coming up with uh, electric cars. We are doing everything to uh, 
make a cut on our dependence on the use of mineral fuels. We are obsessed with maintaining a clean environment. We have been intensifying the rhetorics of go green, green AI, green city. We, we are all the time talking about go, go green and choose green, you know, make a cut on our dependence on the use of mineral fuels, manage the uh, release of uh, CO2 gas. Then on the one hand, we are talking about uh, managing our degrading environments, forestalling disasters stemming from uh, invincible climate change. On the other, we are uh, freely using artificial intelligence chatbot. Even if we don't need uh, so many images, impulsively and audaciously, we keep clicking on the image engineering chatbot. And each time we click, we are contributing. You know, we, we give a single prompt to artificial intelligence and keep replicating without twisting our prompt. AI want to give a different uh, types of images or content. We are all unaware of that. So now is the time to, to uh, strike a balance between our uh, impulsive rush for artificial intelligence affordance and our uh, duty as a responsible citizen towards the environmental integrity. So title is uh, Pedagogical and Educational Responses to Environmental Harms and Hazards from AI Chatbots Growing Application. So Stacey, would you scroll down? I, I would like to uh, read the slide briefly. So um, I have- she, Shiva, just a, a heads up, that's 15 minutes. So if you could wrap in the next minute. Okay. How many minutes do I have right now? Five minutes? None. We're we're at the end. So if you oh, could yeah, okay. wrap in the next so, minute. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for the reminder. So I have uh, brought five, five uh, strategies, five uh, approaches to uh, addressing the environmental impact of AI. One is raising awareness, educator include environmental literacy, raise awareness. Second is promote sustainable AI practices. Please scroll down. I would like to remember encouraging uh, that in your decision making process, encourage a reasonable and uh, humanistic normative uh, decision making process. And uh, scroll down, incorporating disciplinary learning. Cross-disciplinary conversation is in its last but not least, assigning real-world projects. So by adopting these five strategies, we can uh, somehow manage the threat posed by AI to our search for environmental justice or uh, in our attempt toward forestalling the looming specter of Anthropocene. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva. Um, next up, we have Shu Wan. Shu Wan is currently a doctoral student in the Department of History at the University of Buffalo. So I'll hand things over to Shu, and I will uh, give you a two-minute warning in the chat as well, Shu, for you. Thank you so much. Can you guys see my? Um, let me give me a second. I'm trying to. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Shu Wan. I'm very, very um, sorry. Give me a second. Hello, my name is Shua. Um, as you know, I'm a PhD student and a graduate instructor at the University at the University at Buffalo now. And the title of my presentation today is called "Being Academic Works and Assignment in the Meantime." Uh, I mean, um, more to toward uh pedagogy of history podcasting. But as an experienced podcast hoster on the New Books Network and the history instructor at the University at Buffalo. I can turn here. I can learn that podcast and their production should be integrated into the history classroom. Besides reading and writing the traditional way of learning history, listening and listening to and making podcasts should help students acquire academic thinking skill as well. Reviewing my past experiments on augmenting, sorry, augmenting podcasts into history classes. Here, I want to examine or explore the pedagogy of podcasting history in the higher education. So here, um, as I say, as an academic podcaster and project instructor, I began my experiments with the integrating integration of podcasts into classroom a few years ago when working as a teaching assistant, oh, sorry, when, teach, when working as a teacher, 
teaching assistant in Dr. Wally's workers class in late 2022. I, I designed a group-based podcasting assignment in which students were assigned him consisting of three or five people to produce world history theme podcast with a reference to a class reading and other uh, external resources. Students project to cover a broad range of a topic such as potato for men in Ireland and the Columbia exchange of plants and animals. And during the design and deployment of this assignment, I found it difficult to teach students how to produce podcasts on those popular platforms or ever popular platforms like Zencastra or Riverside. They are comprehensive, I mean those platforms they are very comprehensive, but the complex there and by the complex fun functions often confuse my students um, and which encourage me to seek other options, alternative option when design, um, designing podcasting assignment for the future courses. Coincidentally, one student in the work class talked to me, um, me to think about use um, TikTok as the alternate for those um, popular or ever popular platform for podcasting. Growing up in the early 1990s, I used to understand podcast as, um, alternate, uh, sorry, as an innovative way of broadcasting. It seemed to only include an audio file and sometimes transcribed as supplemental material. But for those gener generation they use, um, TikTok is a plug and play option for producing podcasting. Taking the students' open any suggestion, I designed a, a TikTok-based podcast assignment when teaching Asian history in the winter of 2023. And based on these experiments, I published some article, I mean, early this year. So besides podcasting, besides producing podcasts as an alternative assignment, I also experimented with their potential as supplemental teaching material. During my work experience as a teaching assistant, I noticed that young college students today, they seem to not enjoy assigned reading, but prefer to listen or watch audio-visual audio material for learning history. In some classes, teachers assign course reading and movies or, or radio clips to students in different weeks, and I noticed that audio-visual content seem to be must seem to sorry seem to be um, much more efficient way for encouraging students class discussion because the content their content are more compelling to those students. This trend is the sorry is the, is the, is embodied in a Korean student a Korean member student's suggestion in an Asian history class I, we, in which I work as a teaching assistant. Unlike those boring history class reading. Um, retrieve from like Confucian or Taoist writing, I mean, that's ancient philosopher's writings. This guy, this Korean American student suggests me to integrate the cool rap music. Here is the uh, screenshot of the, 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 the music, the video, um, MTV music video on, uh, on YouTube. And he suggests me to integrate a cool, this such cool thing he called cool rap music regarding ancient Western and Eastern philosopher into the classroom. While the music, I have to say, the music rap is too non-academic to fit history education on the college level. But his suggestion drove me to think about the argument in my curricular design with audio material, such as, so, so, I mean, audio material with academic reader, such as academic podcast episode. And coincidentally, during my preparation for an Asian history theme winter class in November of 2023, I just interviewed a UK-based disability scholar, Sarah Donzi, for New Books Network. In the interview, she used a plain language to explain her argument by referencing evidence inside and outside of her book. And in a history theme session in the classroom, because I'm a his disability historian, so I try to add history related re relevant session, a special session into my class. So when um sorry, when adding this kind of session, I request request my students to read chapter from Don Sarah book and meantime listening to her talk, her podcast, the summarize, I request students to summarize their funding and post them on a, on a, on a pre-designed um, Padlet page. 
curiously, while assigned to complete a 10 week reading in the class, this submission on this week was very beautiful, it was very beautiful, it was, it was, much, was much more better than the remaining weeks. These successful uh, su experience suggests the efficiency of academic podcast as supplemental curriculum material. However, within the pedagogical practice of podcasting, I referenced the best. Uh, I referenced the best practice of other, other history instructors and podcast. But in the process, I was surprised. I was surprised. In spite of the proliferation of academic podcasting and podcasters like me, their work are often prone to be viewed as public services or the services for the general public and for the general audience. By contrast, when publishing on new, new Books Network, I elaborate on how I try to make my episode as academic as, as, as well as a scholarly publication when interviewing disability scholars for their new books. I design my podcast as an inclusive space, inclusive space in which academics can avoid the intensive use of terminology, too much terminology, but still maintain academic rigor. Defining its, its audience as a curious, educated, a friend, a reader, interested in the world and what goes on it. New Books Network, the majority, the majority of listeners are well educated. Rather than, I think, rather than then Opera Winfrey's book club, I prepare my book talk, my podcast, um, as a, as a, pro, a pro, 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 prepare my podcast for quasi-professional, quasi-academic listeners. This in-between group has a diverse identity, range from senior student in, senior college student in the humanity to professor in discipline art and discipline studies. Despite my liberation on preparing the podcast, but my work was still identified as media presence or public engagement on most of my interviewees' website or their CV. So, but this public positioning of podcasts, academic podcasts, I think is based on a problematic assumption on pro, 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 sorry, prioritizing publication with the assessment of academic work today. As an Asian originated Asian historian, I create this kind of problem, problematic and privileged positioning of podcasts from the post-colonial perspective. The modern academic culture originated in Europe, especially Germany. The home country of Gutenberg, the global expansion of publication-centric academic culture went alongside the expansion of the printing technology. However, in most periods of time, the world history and the most part of most part of world, human world, human society, text is not only the major way to preserve and promote knowledge and information. Instead, mouth to ear and other non textual media were widely employed for recording in human, in the non Western human society, so especially in Asia. This historical fact is no stranger for Asian history and like me. So, when teaching Asian history course, I try my best to. To, to persuade my students to transcend the prejudice by avoiding laboring oral tradition, oral culture with the tag of backwardness. Hence, uh, I think Asian historians should take concern about cohesion between form of content when designing their Asian history class. Moreover, the renewed research on learning science also impel us to consider pedagogical potential of podcasting. Uh, the priest Previous mentioned the Korean student preference rap music over reading rejects his audio learning style. Well, we know there are four types of learning style. It's become common sense for college to today, but many humanist scholars are still prone to regard um, uh, to regard to regard the student's uh, um, unwillingness to read as a symbol of the humanity in process. So they don't like read. They don't like reading, they don't read a book. They don't read a book now, those students don't read a book now. So it's, it's, it's widely viewed as a symbol of the humanity in process that we are in a trouble. But range from the chronicle and range from the chronicle of higher education and new time, new times higher education, an increased number of discussion by leading scholars in humanity share their caution about decline of reading in higher education. 
to uh, really assess this change in learning behavior, I think it's just a change in learning behavior, learning style. It's urgent to develop the pedagogy of podcasting for the humanity today. And reflecting you know, on my teaching experience, I can attend uh, such kind of pedagogy. And in my here, I just have some initial thoughts. So I say it's two words to the pedagogy. So for here, I find my initial thoughts about such kind of alternative pedagogy should consist, should consist of three sessions. So the first session is the uh, reference resources academically when podcasting for education purposes. So we need to, as why. Well, so in other words, when doing academic podcasting, we should do our best to podcast to academic podcast to to do our best to maintaining the academic rigor. Secondly, the pedagogy of podcasting should advocate student collab collaboration in completing assignments. So as I mentioned, for, for both, my first time to do the to design the podcasting assignment, I the format. It's format is as a group work. I think podcasting comparing to compare to the traditional writing assignment, podcasting is easy. is It's easy to to encourage teamwork. So in which some students do podcasting, some students do like do do the do the do, to write the transcript, and some students do the editing after the after the recording something. So it's easy to have a division of a different duty among students. So last is very important, the most important one, as an Asian person, as an Asian person, non-white person, I think the voice of, of non-white people should take into account for this new pedagogy, as I mentioned, because of the importance of um, oral tradition, oral culture in non-Western context, in especially in Asia and Africa, I think in, with the concern uh, about the uh, cohesion between content and form, it's important to integrate more non-white, non-European, non-Western voice into the pedagogy. So, it, and it, which is very important. So, this is my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shu. And finally, for our last presentation of the panel, we have Augusto Oliveira and Julia uh, Diesel. So Augusto is a master's student at Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. His research intersects, um, or his research interests lie in the fields of academic literacy and discourses, and he's currently investigating linguistic discursive aspects in science dissemination podcast scripts produced by researchers in training. And Julia is an undergraduate student in linguistics and literature at Sao Paulo State University in Brazil, and her research interests lie in the field of digital literacy and discourse studies. So I will hand things over to Augusto and Julia. Thank you, Stacey. Um, so I'm here today with Augusto to do a presentation that has to do with the, about the work that we've been developing together. And it goes from um, a proposal of an activity that we already made with uh, students in post-graduation um, courses. So we touted it today, podcasts and literacies in higher education, modes of engagement and non-engagement of postgraduate students. So our research comes from uh, the research groups that we are involved in, that it has to do with um, a work that we've been developing as a team that studies the contemporary practice of academic scientific literacies in different fields of knowledge. So we uh, are not properly podcasters. Uh, we've been studying how podcasts are being used in an academia and how the students are ready or not to mobilize this practice as, uh, as a scientist. So um, from this, our main objective is to describe from a linguistic and discursive point of view, the ways in which Brazilian postgraduate students are either engaged or non-engaged in the production of a science podcast scripts in higher education. 
Um, from this, we expect to capture the differences between the expectations that we have from the students to uh, disseminate their work and their research and what they are actually capable of doing and promoting through a, a podcast production. And for this, uh, we come from a theoretical framework that uh, comes from a study from Edgar in 2009 that it uh, looks to the practice guided to develop a creative use of podcasts in academic context and also Tanani uh, 2023 that uh, speaks about an analysis guided to capture from the podcast not only the phonic materiality of media but also the linguistic discursive practice that constituted it's um, more it goes further than the format, but what kind of language that is being uh, used and if the students would be ready to uh, do this kind of adaptations in the format of podcasts. So after we have um, also the multiliteracy students that um, it comes from a, a framework that works with the available designs that would be the resources available for the constructing meanings from culture, social practice, and orders of discourse. So it's what the what people have contact with day to day. So it's everything that is uh, already produced and also the, the culture they're uh, involved in and the social practice they already have contact with to uh, create a design that would be a practice in constructing, constructing meanings uh, and ways of representing what is known. So the design would be the adaptation of the available designs they already have contact with to build a, a design. And the redesign would be the possibilities of transforming the construction of meanings from the work done. So it would be the other ways to um, develop the same subject the same content uh, the same test in other ways that comes from the design that was built in the available design so it's kind of a cycle that uh, we already do we already work with this uh, cycle but we don't really notice so we come from this um, this studies the motor literacy studies to investigate how the students mobilize the available designs to build their own design and do a redesign to uh, apply it to the podcast format. So after we have um, a, a brief overview of the podcast conception in Brazil, uh, we thought it, it was important to highlight that it uh, it grew a lot in, during the pandemic years. Uh, in the third year of the pandemic in 2021, we became the third world, to, the third country to most consume the format in the world. And it was a kind of new for the Brazilian culture of consuming consumption of media. And 57% of the respondents started listening to podcasts during the pandemic. So we have a, a dynamic of uh, consumption of media and information that has changed a lot during the pandemic years. And after that, uh, I also brought uh, some numbers to compare the consumption between Brazil and the USA and also the world average. We have uh, this country's um, Above the average of the, the global consumption, we have Brazil uh, with big numbers of consumption of podcasts and also internet. We spend an average of nine hours and 13 minutes per day on internet. And listening to podcasts, we have an average of an hour uh, per day. And we have 39% uh, of Brazilians who listen to podcasts every week. And after that, um, now Augusto will speak a little about the, the proposal of uh, assignment that we, we had with our students. 
So uh, just talking a little bit about the material we are working with. Uh, we've collected material uh, inside this course entitled Academic Literacy Workshop. This course was offered by four postgraduate programs of our university, the Sao Paulo State University, the University of Sao Paulo, and the Catholic University of Minas Gerais uh, in the fields of education, literature, and linguistics. Here uh, we have a map and the stars is where the university, the universities is uh, located, so so you can see it. Uh, and the public of this course was graduates, master students, master graduates, and also PhD students. During this course, the students had to prepare a lot of genres related to the academic field, and uh, so we uh, the professors of the course kind of trained the students to uh, repair in some discursive aspects of these genres and not only in the, the structural aspects, as you can see in some contexts. Uh, here we have uh, a lot of, a, a little bit of the instruction that were gave to, to the students. We are working with 39 written productions in the form of scripts of, for science broadcast podcasts. And uh, the students produced by the students enrolled in the course, and the structure of the, the activity did not mention any specific detail that the students we need to follow. So we uh, kind of left the students free to produce a podcast script as they wanted, as they uh, already like know the format, as Julia mentioned. And here we have uh, a little bit of the, the instructions. So the instruction was, you must produce a written script for scientific dissemination podcasts. And the students had to take into account the uh, personal introduction and also the presentation of the object of research, right? So here we have an example of what would be considered a podcast script since we are working with the uh, the production of podcasts and not with the consumption, right? So uh, this was kind of what was expected from the students. And here we have uh, a detail about the data analysis, right? The key analysis, uh, the key question for our analysis was in carrying out the activity, how did the students appropriate knowledge about two main things? The first one, is the podcast consumption, and the second one is literacy practices in the academic scientific sphere. sphere. So uh, we're considering a kind of continuum between a lesser engagement with the activity and a greater engagement with the activity in which we classified the productions that was delivered by, by the students, right? So here we have, uh, we, we are exploring the first, uh, the first part of the analysis, which uh, reunite aspects that show a greater engagement uh, of the students with the podcast format and a greater appropriation of this engagement in carrying out the activity. So we used as a criteria to classify the, the material, the use of an accessible lexicon in the, the script, the marking of conversational exchanges in the script, the indication of multimedia resources like soundtrack, transition effects, so on and so forth. The simulation of an interview or a monologue during the script. And also if the students take, in, uh, take into account the presence of a listener, like asking questions, inviting to interact and greeting the public, right? We, are, we base this criteria in the work of Chagas and Nassarim. So here we have an example of a production that is located in the continuum as a greater engagement, right? So in the script, we can see some aspects that point to a certain experience of the student with the listening or production or, or production of focus, right? One example would be the indication of the multimedia resource. So we have in red in the example, the minutes, uh, the, the duration of the, the block of the podcasts. We also have the aspect of considering the, listening, the listener's presence. So in this case, the student say hello to the, to the listener. And he also say, have you ever stopped to think about it? What does freedom of expression means? Does it seem simple to you? 
So we have these questions being delivered to the listener. We also have the use of an accessible language, right, of, a, of an accessible lexicon, which would be kind of expected from scientific dissemination products. So we have expressions like, did you feel the drama? And we also have uh, the producer recognizing that the subject of the podcast may be difficult to the listener, right? And we also have uh, another aspect that would be the connection with protocol life that the student does where, from his research to the protocol life of the listener, right? So uh, an example would be the, the line, one day or another, you or someone close to you may find yourself involved or obliged to take a standard in a situation because you said what you thought. We also have the second part of the analysis, uh, which would be that uh, the kind of productions that had lesser engagement with uh, the format podcast, right? So some aspects that would be indicate this lesser engagement with the, the podcast format and a greater engagement with the practices that come from the academic scientific sphere would be the use of a theoretical lexicon the use of academic and scientific writing resources like bibliographical references, direct quotations, and also the use of a rhetorical organization of academic scientific genres with an introduction and justification and general or specific objects and methodology like in, uh, in our research progress, right? So here we have an example of a type of texts that would be classified as a lesser engagement of the student with the podcast format, right? So we have three main aspects, which would be the first one, the rhetorical organization. So here the student used a rhetorical organization to the podcast script that is really similar to another academic genres, right? Like a, like a paper, like a research project. So we have here the final considerations this student specifically, uh, he did blocks like the like introduction, uh, methodology, and final considerations. Here we have the final considerations. We also have the aspect of uh, dimension to resources of academic scientific writing, right? So as you can see, the student uh, mentioned as uh, academic work, like he, he do this kind uh, of reference to an academic work in the example. We have, according to Quevedo Camargo and Scaramucci, like it's a direct quotation. And we also have uh, the aspect in which the student take into account the presence of an auditor, of a listener, right? So an example would be when the, the students say, we hope you enjoyed our discussion and see you the next time. So we see that even though the script symbolize a lesser engagement with the podcast format and a greater engagement with academic genres format, we have some aspects that uh, points that shows us the mixture of literacy practices, right? Because the students uh, not only used uh, knowledge provided by one specific place. So the discussion, we, uh, we are that we realized that by responding to an activity for which they have not been trained, the students have not been trained to do this, academic writers are describing this themselves in different social practices, right? In this case, the practices are stemming not only from the relationship with digital technologies, but also from the relationship with academic practices, right? And with MacGar, we consider some aspects in the analysis of podcasts in higher education. Since podcasts uh, could be considered as a mean of involving students a democratizing scientific content beyond the confines of the university. And some questions could be raised in this part of the, the, the reflection that would be, what are the demands of, this of the institutions, right? So what are the universities expecting from their students to do in terms of scientific dissemination and the appropriation of digital media like podcasts. What are the demands of the society? So what the society expects from science and from scientific communities? And what do the students need to reach institu institutional and social expectations, right? Uh, here we have uh, brief uh, theoretical references and we 
say thank you to your attention here. We have our emails and we are open to discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Augusto and Julia. So that brings us to the end of our panel session. We have about five minutes if there are some questions. I already see one. Um, thank you for starting the trend, Sebastian. So if that, uh, did Phil hand raise if you've got a question. Please go ahead, Sebastian. My apologies, you might not be able to unmute. I'll take care of that one second, Sebastian. Okay, try now. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I have a question specifically for Daniel. Um, what advice can you offer uh, for history students like myself uh, regarding how to present or situate uh, my academic podcasting work when uh, looking forward to PhD programs or even the job market. Yeah, thanks Sebastian. Um, I'll just answer quickly. Um, and I'll say up front, despite some of my misgivings about the term podcast, I actually think it's it's a really great thing to forefront as you go out there onto the job market or, or wherever you're going. It was pretty instrumental in me getting the current job I have, right? So. Um, me niggling into the this, you know, any of the negative baggage around the term, notwithstanding, I think it's something that is actually a really, um, uh, it's a skill and, and a, an experience that if you have it, um, talk about it. And, and I think one of the ways that you can do that, you can na name the fact that you have the experience and talk a little bit about like what that experience has meant to you, how the you know the particular skills that maybe you developed in doing it or why it's why you feel it's meaningful to you or to the work of history but but it's a, it's an absolutely you know great skill to to have and put out there so yeah don't be shy And uh, Jay Bradley. There we go. I was uh, just interested in how kind of this was situated or framed, you know, this idea of uh, podcasting is intellectual and scholarly work, podcasting is pedagogy and a kind of metatextual analysis of podcasting studies. And I'm just wondering for the, for the panel, it seems like the metatextual analysis is finding more of a way into academia because we have more podcasts to work from. I'm just wondering, Daniel or whoever, have you done any work? You know, we, we often think of situating the work that we do as podcasters as the work of scholarship or teaching, but with respect to kind of a metatextual analysis of scholarship, I'm just wondering what you guys, your thoughts on that are because it was, it was really interesting to watch that presentation on analyzing podcast work. Hi, Bradley. Yeah. Would you allow me to answer your questions? Sure. Okay. So I believe in the pedagogy of podcast, podcast pedagogy. I, I believe in podcast pedagogy. During COVID-19, when we were all under house arrest, we had to switch to online instructional modality. And uh, I used to receive students' drafts through email. I carefully read their assignment. I added my feedback on their margin. In addition to this, I instantly used the Spotify podcasting tool Anchor. I also recorded my uh, feedback on uh, Spotify Anchor. This way I created a podcast and shared the link because Spotify Anchor is so streamlined and customized that uh, at the touch of the button, we can uh, create a link. I share the link with my student. In this way, my students received written feedback on their draft from me. 
during COVID, and they also got uh, my feedback uh, through podcast. That means orally. In this way, even if students were scattered and distanced from their instructor, they felt closely connected to their instructor. This is how I leverage podcasting pedagogy. In addition to Spotify Anchor, I use Audacity and uh, Adobe Audition also. So for me, podcasting can be used as a powerful tool to run a peer review session also. Sometimes what happens? Some students may be absent from the class. And if their instructor is running a peer review session, then whatever draft the instructor has assigned to the student means who is absent, then a student can email the draft, email the draft, and then ask the student, "Hey, you can share your peer review feedback orally to your assigned peer." In this way, as a rhetoric and pedagogy scholar, I believe in the affordances of what Walter Ong said: secondary orality. Because in tribal community, people practice oral communication, oral literacy. But now, our literacy practice has become sophisticated. We are surrounded with the numerous tools and technology of oral communication. That is what a famous rhetoric scholar Walter Ong called secondary orality. So I urge every instructor and learners to capitalize on so much affordances stemming from the use of podcasting tools such as. Adobe Audition, uh, Spotify, Anchor, and Audacity, and the list goes on. I don't know if my answer convinces you or not. This is what I have. Thank you. Any other comments on uh, Jay Bradley's question from our panel? If not, then I will officially close our session. Um, we have our next batch of sessions coming up in 45 minutes. Um, look at that right on it, Rebecca in the chat, uh, and look forward to seeing you all in there. Thanks so much. Thank you a lot. See you.